All right, so um, this is just a quick review of what we did Tuesday. Um, so uh, a political scientist surveys 20 of the current 106 representatives in Congress. Of them, 14 said they're uh, supporting a new bill, 12 were not supporting, and two were undecided. Um, so what is population? So it's just, we're just reviewing some definitions. Again, as I said, definitions are the whole, whole thing with statistics. So population is, is just everything you want to study, right? So here, he's, it, he's really interested in how the representatives in a state Congress are going to act. So his population is just all of them, the representatives, the, one, all, the 106 representatives, just all of them, it's everything. Okay. Cool, any questions? No. Uh, what is the size of the population? So there's 106 of them. It's the total population. What is the size of the sample? So the sample is the number that he took out of the whole, the population. So the sample here, is going to be the size, how many people he took, so 28. Okay. Any questions? Just stop me if a definition, if I haven't reviewed. Um, and then give a sample statistic. So remember, statistic is the, the sort of the things you compute from the data that you collect from your sample. So you have the population at large, the whole thing. You take a little sample, tiny sample, uh, and you pull them or survey them or whatever you're doing to them. And you then use that raw data to compute statistics, some, some information about the sample, which you can then exp uh, you know, stretch to the population at large. So here, um, a sample of statistics uh, for the portion of voters surveyed who said they were supporting the bill. So uh, statistics like that, we know that 12 said they were not supporting it and 14 said they were supporting it. So if we surveyed 28 of them and 14 said they were supporting it, we can figure out what percentage of the sample said they were supporting it, right? So I will do 14 over, and again, the sample size is 28. And so you wouldn't put 106 because you didn't pull 106 people, you only pulled 28. So if you, pulled, if you put 106 there, you're kind of selling yourself short. Um, and then I want it as a percent. So I'll do times 100, All right? And so let's see, oh, maybe, maybe there you go. So 14 divided by 28, oh, I guess that's not bad. <laughs> uh, and then, oh, 28, sorry, 14 divided by 28. And then uh, we don't need a calculator for this, but times 100, 50%, All right? So what that means is that 50% of uh, this sample said they supported it. So said they supported the bill. How is it 50% though? Because the supporting is bigger than the 12. The 14 is bigger than the 12. Yeah. Oh, never mind. It's because two are undecided. Never oh, I mind. see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two are undecided. So I don't know what that counts as. Um, I guess you could interpret that differently. Um, but but yeah, so 50% said they supported it. Um, and so strictly speaking, this is only 50% of the sample. But if you take your sample correctly, the idea anyway is that you can take this 50% and say, well, if I did ask everyone, they, it would still be around 50. Now that's not really true in general, especially with th political things like this, because what if you, um, it doesn't say what, like over here, it doesn't say what the 28 were. Like if this is, um, you know, if these 106 are evenly split Democrat, Republican, and the 28 are just Republican or Democrat, then, or even mostly one or the other, then your numbers are gonna be kind of screwed. Um, they're not going to quite work right, right? Because your your sample won't be representative of the population at large, um, so that could be a problem. But that's the that's the goal really is to take a sample statistic statistic and infer information about the population at large. Very difficult, um, but yeah. So again, definitions: population, sample, 
statistic is kind of a lame definition, but there. questions? That first one. As I said, these go really short because like this one, just one number. All right. So we also talked about last time uh, a bunch of sampling methods. So maybe I should find my use my go to my note. Oh my god, I'll be right in a second. So we talked about a bunch of these. So we can kind of run through them again. Uh, here we are. So we talked about random, a random sample. So random sample is exactly what it sounds like. It's just you have a population and you pick things at random. There we, go. Um, we had stratified sampling. So remember, stratified sampling is it kind of works for these political situations where you have two parties or even you know n many parties, and you want to choose a, a relatively uh, diverse sample. So what you do is you break your population into two groups and then you randomly choose people from those two groups such that your sample has a, has a correct proportion from those two groups as the same as the population at large. So if it's 50-50 in the population, then you would take 50-50 for your sample from the two groups so that it represents it. So again, if it was 50 Democrat, 50% Republican, you would take 50% of your sample from the one side and 50% from the other and you'd have a decent representation. All right, so that's stratified. We also had cluster, kind of like stratified, right? You're, you're dealing with groups of the population, but these groups don't, aren't, um, what's the word? They aren't, uh, they, they aren't like, you're not considering like what percentage of the population each group is. You're just breaking it into, into groups and kind of selecting groups at random. It's, it, the good example here is like the school example. You wanna poll high schoolers, maybe your college students, and so you choose, you know, five random classrooms from, you know, maybe a hundred different classrooms, and you go into those rooms and pull those students. Right. So that's it. It's kind of like random sampling. So as I said, a lot of these two kind of uh, overlap. So if you have an example where you you maybe you think, oh, that sounds more like random sampling, it very well could kind of have random sampling in it, like cluster sampling kind of has some random sampling, especially if, you know, this, this randomness of selecting different subgroups is, is random. So in some sense, they're similar. Um, we had systematic. Systematic is the one where you're at a grocery store and you're asked to pull like every 10th customer. It's basically you're pulling people based on some kind of scheme or system. Anything like that would be systematic. It's got a system to it. Um, and last but not least, I think, let me see. Yeah, last but not least of the techniques we talked about, was convenience sampling. And convenience sampling is, is just, and again, this could be similar to systematic. Like if you're a grocery store person and you're pulling people every 10th person at the grocery store, there's an element of convenience there because that person might not talk to you. They might just keep walking. And so convenience is you're just selecting people based on whatever kind of, if they talk to you at all, all right? Um, all right, so with those briefly reviewed, Let's try to classify some examples. So indicate which sampling method was used. Right. Every fourth person in a class was selected. What do we think? It's not, systematic. It's systematic, right? You're doing things, you know, every fourth. You do, that's usually what it is. All right. Um, a sample was selected to contain 25 men and 35 women. Would that be cluster sampling? I think it would be cluster. It's, it could be, it depends. I, guess, I don't think there's enough information. It's going to be cluster or stratified. Because I was writing them down as you were explaining them. Yeah. Yeah, it, it could be both. It depends. So like, I would, I would probably lean towards stratified, but it, it, could, be, it could be both. All right. If you were choosing the 25 and 35 women, or 25 men and 35 women, because that was what was representative of the population, then it would be stratified. But it could be cluster if you just break it into groups and you're choosing that group of men and that group of women. Viewers of a new TV show are asked to vote on the show's website. Convenience? Yep, convenience, exactly. Because you're just asking someone to do something, like, you know, you're, you're kind of saying, oh, it's up to you to do it. I'm relying on you to, to, to actually do this thing. Um, and so you only get a certain group of people who, who will do it in that case, because most people will just be like, eh, I don't need it. Um, a website randomly selects 50 of their customers to send a satisfaction survey. 
random sampling. Yep, that one's just random. Um, and then to uh, survey voters in a town, a polling company randomly selects 10 city blocks and interviews everyone who lives on those blocks. Stratified? Is that how you say it? Stratified? Yeah, I, that could be strat. I think this one's going to be cluster. So I think if this one, they're basically you take your whole city and you break it into these blocks and then you just choose 10 random ones. So that one, I think that one's definitely be cluster. The, again, the difference with cluster and stratified is that stratified, you're trying to preserve some ratio or like some, um, you know, percentage kind of proportion uh, in the population in your sample. Uh, and so like, if it, if it was this one up here with the men and women, maybe, uh, you know, it, I, I don't think there, there are more men in, or there are more women on, in populations than there are men, but I don't think it's that different. I think it's like 49, 51%. So, um, I, I'm still not sure exactly what they want for this one, but um, for, for, for stratified, you're trying to preserve a proportion. So like if you were trying to keep it the same men and women as it is in the population in general in your sample, you would choose like 49% men and 51% women or whatever it is. Um, but with cluster, you're just choosing groups at random. So like here, there's no information about the city blocks. We're not, nothing, we're not trying to preserve any information from the population in our sample. We're just choosing them randomly. Any questions about the methods that we kind of talked about very briefly? Yeah, we did more of this yesterday, Tuesday. All right, and this last question, this is kind of, kind of interesting, right? Um, and this, so, so we're kind of just reviewing all the topics we talked about yesterday. We talked about um, those basic definitions of statistics, or Tuesday, we talked about sampling methods of statistics. And the last thing we talked about Tuesday was sampling bias. So that's what this one's about. Um, countries with higher G GDP per capita have been found to have lower case fatality rates for COVID-19. Why might this be? What's GDP? Oh, uh, gross domestic product. So it's like their economic output. Um, so basically richer countries. Um, maybe because they don't have to go out and go shop. That could, that could be like the people are able to do things more remotely. They don't have to go to work. That, that could, that could well, yeah, but like, say a rich person hires someone to do the grocery shopping. Then another rich person hires that same person to do the gro grocery shopping. Yeah. So as long as that person doesn't have COVID, nobody else is going to get COVID because he's doing all the shopping. That's true. But would that, would that impact their case fatality rate? I mean, if there's no cases, how do they have a fatality rate? That is true. But... That is true. So they have low cases, so they have fewer deaths. That could be. That could be. What else? Anyone else have any ideas? I mean, it just could be that they have better med medical systems. That is probably part of it as well. Um, what about what about? So if you're if you're a more wealthy wealthy like wealthy country, you probably have more resources, like you said, medical systems, and and those medical resources probably also uh, flow into having more testing ability, right? So if you're like Zimbabwe or, or really a more, more poor country, you're only testing the people who are in the hospitals, right? You're testing, uh, you're really only testing people who are sick and you wanna see if they have it because it's vitally important that you know they have it. And, and so you're, you're just testing the hospitals basically. But if you're somewhere like the United States or like somewhere in Europe, you have a lot more resources. And so you can test millions and millions of people who aren't even showing symptoms. Uh, and so what happens is that in these countries with more resources, they're able to test more people. And so you, you get a better idea of how many people actually have it. And, and then you know, you know who dies, obviously. So you, you have that data as well. But, um, and, and so that's the difference. So when you test more people, your case fatality rate will go down because you're, you're, you have more asymptomatic cases, you have more, more you know, uh, mild cases where people aren't showing as bad symptoms. And other in a in a poorer country, those people wouldn't be tested at all. So they have a high number; they have the same number of deaths, but they have fewer cases. If that makes sense. So it comes down to testing, really. So um, so more testing, more testing reveals um, the actual number of cases. 
right? <clears throat> and so the more cases you have, like your deaths aren't going to go up when you test more, right? Like people who are dying of COVID-19 are dying and they get tested and that's it. They know who they are. But the people who aren't dying are the ones you need, you, you need, you need to understand more to understand the actual case fatality rate. So that's why. It's kind of cool. Right? Any questions about that? And it, it could be too, because, you know, like in other countries too, we, we were able to do things remotely here. People are able to work remotely, but in other countries, you know, people can't re work remotely. So that that's probably spreading more and they might have worse medical care. So it's a little both. Speaking right. of COVID, for everybody that wants to know with yeah. the whole COVID situation at work, we are officially pot negative for all residents. None of our residents at work have COVID now. Oh, that's exciting. That's great. Hopefully like it stays that way. <laughs> well, when we did mass testing in the beginning of the week, only one staff tested positive. That's the only case we have right now. Wow, that's impressive. And it was a third shifter, so she's not around anybody. So we don't think after next week, we shouldn't have any more positive cases. Great, yeah, let's hope. I know, because those assisted living homes are not ideal for COVID. <laughs> Let's see, let's see. All right, so that was the review. Now we're getting back into 10.3. So 10.3, remember, was bias. So what that example we just did um, was, a, is a, is, was a kind of bias because you, basically what happens is, so to compute the case fatality rate, so maybe I should write that if it's not clear. So case, case fatality rate. So it's gonna be like the, the dead, number of dead over total cases, all right? So basically what's happening here, and you're computing this on a sample, right? You literally can't test everyone, although the number of dead will basically be known, right? Because they're dying. So you'll know this one, but the total cases is essentially a sample because you can't test every single person in the country. You, you probably can, but it's hard. So what happens is that your sample for these poor countries is really small. And so when this bottom number is smaller, it makes the whole, the whole division bigger. When the bottom number is bigger, it makes the whole division smaller. And, and so it's kind of an opposite relationship. Um, but yeah, and so when your sample is too small, it's a, it's a kind of sample bias because it, it's not representing accurately the population. Like you're, you don't, you're not quite right. Um, uh, and yesterday we talked about uh, sampling bias and that's, an example of that kind of bias where your something is systematically wrong with your sample, the way you construct it, by way you're choosing people from your population, something's wrong and it's not representing how the actual population is. This is a different kind of bias. So, so it, it occurs when individuals selected to be in the sample um, uh, who do respond, do not respond, wait, wait, what am I saying? Basically, the people who respond have different opinions than the ones who don't respond. So like um, that example we talked about Tuesday as well, where it was uh, the political poll in 1936 with FDR and Alfred Landon. Um, the people who respond, responded to this poll were overwhelmingly fans. I mean, it wasn't that much, but it was good enough. They were mo mostly fans of Alfred Landon, like they were his supporters because they were more interested in getting the incumbent out than the incumbent supporters were in keeping him in. So the people who responded were mostly of one persuasion rather than the other, and so the sample is, is messed up. Um, but yeah, let's, let's try an example. So let me try to leave that, there we go. All right, so an organization conducts a poll to determine the percentage of households speaking a foreign language as their primary language. Uh, and I don't know why you would ever do this, but they can perform the study by mailing out a questionnaire in English, just English. Right. And that's obviously the problem um, because the whole point of this poll is that you want to you want to determine the amount of households in your community maybe that speak a foreign language as their primary language so something other than english as their primary language and so if you're sending out this mailing in english you you might not get full response right so suppose you mail this this questionnaire out to to someone to a household where they speak mainly spanish or like portuguese or something 
and uh, if maybe their English isn't strong, and so they're going to look at this card and just throw it away because <laughs> they're not getting anything out of uh, out of filling it out and returning it to you. It's just a poll, so you know you're not going to get their response, and, and you know kind of similar thing. So um, since it's only in English, uh, some non-English speakers, oops, can't spell English today, English speakers may not respond. Right. And so that's an example of non-response bias. So you're, the way like the, your survey is sort of unintentionally excluding people who speak a different language, and that's exactly what your survey is about. So the people who do not respond have a different opinion or respond differently than the people who do respond. Right? And so it sways your survey one way. Um, and so any ideas on how we can fix this? Right? So like, if we only mailed it in English initially, a really easy way to fix it would just to be to write the questions in maybe a few different languages. Like the, the second most common language in the, in the United States is Spanish. I don't know what the third is, but you could just maybe list it in a couple, two or three most common languages in the United States. And, and then you'd probably be pretty safe. You would exclude some people, like maybe some guy in Texas only speaks like, I don't know, Mandarin, but, but you know, you, you're never gonna, never gonna get everyone, but. Could you possibly like put on the piece of paper, like on the back or something like this? in different languages, like go to this website. Yeah, you could do that too. And then you could have more options on the website. Yeah, so, so uh, more language. So I don't know why, sorry about that. More languages slash website. Yeah, so those, those are both good options. All right, so that's not response bias. Um, oh, and, and in general, some other uh, options to fix not response bias. So in this particular example that we just talked about, the problem really is, is that it, it's not in different languages. Um, but in general, non response bias can occur like, so suppose you're doing a telephone um, poll, like you're, you're kind of randomly calling phone numbers from a bank or something. Um, what can happen is that people just won't answer. Um, and, and so the people who do answer are going to have potentially, depending on the survey, different opinions than those who do answer, right? Like maybe it depends, maybe if you're calling at three o'clock, uh, I don't know why you call at three o'clock, like in the afternoon, uh, people might be working. So the people who do answer might be older, or maybe you call really late at night and people who might be older might be in bed. It, it, you know, you, depending when you call, uh, you might get different answers. And so one thing you can do is you can, you can carry calling again. So, um, so repeat, uh, repetition. I don't know. Actually, what did I have here? You know, you missed a big one. Huh? You missed a big one. You said like the times of the day, people working. People yeah. Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if, if these people are working, it's kind of, you're in a pickle. So that's when you keep calling back. I don't know what I meant for this blank though. Just a second. Oh, call, I meant callbacks. All right. <laughs> callbacks. So you just keep calling them back. And then that way, what happens is that you get a more representative sample because basically what you're doing in this case for your sample is you're using random sampling over the phone. But if you exclude these people who don't answer at your certain time, you have sampling bias because your sample won't be actually random. It will be this particular kind of subset. All right. And then the other thing you can do, and this one, you know, this is questionable, is you can use incentives. All right. So things like, as I say, cash, or uh, uh, even if you have a, a very persuasive cover letter on your poll saying, please fill this out, uh, it will save puppies or something. Like, <laughs> um, you know, things like that you could use, but that, this brings more problems. So this could result in um, other issues. So like, what, what other issues could we, could, could pop up 
if we start trying to give cash as incentives, so. Could Sorry. it be like favoritism? What was that? Like if a certain person wins more often than the other, could favoritism be an issue? You could have favoritism, yeah. Like you could have someone coming back and back to try to get more money from you or something. That's an option. That is possibility, so favoritism. Perhaps. Um, the other issue too is if your incentive, especially for cash, if your incentive is just like you're paying them like an Amazon gift cards or something, what might happen is your sample is more poor people who, who really need that Amazon gift card or that cash. And so they, they, they keep coming to your polls. And so you could, you could have, um, could result in uh, more poor people. All right. And I mean, there's nothing necessarily wrong with having more poor people in your sample, <laughs> but it, you need it to be representative of what you're trying to study. So if you're trying to study the population at large, like, every, the, you know, maybe Cat County or something, um, or like Erie County, um, you need to have as many poor people as there are in Cat County as a percentage. And the same with like more middle and richer people. So in, in this case, you might have a ton of lower economic status people and not enough in the middle and the higher range. Right. Is there even semi-rich people in Cattaraugus County? <laughs> there or are. Like County or like Steuben County? I don't know about Steuben. No, well, there's Corning in Steuben. I don't know. Um, I, I can tell you Allegheny County is not Allegheny, great. Allegheny might not have anything. But <laughs> I, someone was telling me, apparently people who own gravel pits are, are, are wealthy. There's a gravel pit in Andover, and that's yeah. Allegheny County. So that could be someone. I, I didn't realize. I thought it was the weirdest thing because gravel's like it's 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 everywhere. So like, how could you make a lot of money? But apparently, it's quite the competitive industry. So they they make bank. But I don't know. Apparently, there's some richer people in Olean, but I don't know. It's weird. Um, but yeah. So you need to represent them. All right. Uh, so that was non-response bias. Again, people who don't respond have different opinions than those who do. Uh, now we're going into we're gonna talk about response bias. Right. So this one is going to be a little more, we're going to talk about some like subcategories of response bias too. Uh, but in general, response bias is the kind of bias that occurs when people, people respond to your survey, but they answer in a way that's not truthful for one reason or another. Um, and it can be anything. So we'll talk, as I said, we'll talk about a few, but let's just start with an example. So uh, a, a kind of simple example is, is if you're asking someone to to talk about something that might be personal or controversial um, and you know they might not be comfortable stating their true feelings so for instance if, if you if you did a survey and you just ask people have you ever done math you know people might not be like oh yeah i did math the other day because you don't want to sound like you do math uh, and it's just it's just not a not a great way to ask a question so you this if you were trying to figure out like the number of drug users in a, in a community in general it's going to be pretty difficult because a lot of people won't admit to doing drugs especially if their job is something sensitive um you know if you are interviewing like i don't know like a police officer or something he he won't probably won't admit to you that he's doing drugs assuming he's doing drugs I, i'm not saying police officers do more drugs than more people but the point is if you're interviewing someone in a sensitive job like that or like a school teacher they're not going to say, oh yeah, I do drugs all the time because even their job, their livelihood's at stake. Even if your poll is anonymous, they don't want to admit things to you. So um, it's difficult to ask questions like that. Just is because- yeah. In school, we had this dumb like questionnaire we had to fill out every single year. And it was like over a hundred questions. Like depending on what you answered, the questions got longer and longer. So nobody wanted to do it. So they'd all click like A. Yeah. Like the whole test will just click A. Yeah. That, and like that's... everybody was stressing how important it was because like <laughs> we got funding for it and nobody cared. Yeah. Yeah, that's a kind of that would be a kind of response bias, exactly. Like they you're answering a survey or something, but your your feelings aren't accurately represented because of something uh, functionally wrong with the survey like in that case it's too long and students attention spans are too short so and they don't there's no incentive like they don't get anything out of it so there, there's just no motivation for them to do it so they click a a a the whole way and so they get bad results um some other ways that you can ask sensitive questions like that i know that they have psychological examinations 
where it's it's like you were saying it's i think the one i took i had a job interview where they had me take one and i, I swear i think it was like 300 questions they were not long and they were just little multiple like a b c d all multiple choice but what they do is they ask you these huge like huge number of questions and they'll ask you similar questions in different ways and what they can do with that is the chances of you you know lying consistently are, are more more low than if for you to lie once or twice so they'll ask you a question in very roundabout in different ways and then they'll compile all that data and try to determine if you were consistent if you were inconsistent and they can have like degrees of accuracy and uh, uh, different characteristics that you might not be comfortable saying straight um so that's one way they can do it i don't know if that has a name there's a whole like subfield of like psychology and statistics involving um like those psychological tests and it's, it's pretty tricky I know that people who give like even like IQ tests, there's like you have to go to there's like whole things you have to do like classes and I don't know. All right, uh, another question. Uh, a survey asked people when was the last time you visited your doctor. So why might this suffer from response bias, or why might not people accurate accurately answer this question? Well, like for situations like the school, when was the last time you went to go see the eye doctor? If you haven't yeah. gone to see the eye doctor in years, they could possibly like, kick you out. Of yeah yeah so you well you might yeah it, like if it's a school or an employer asking you when you went to the last time you went to a doctor you might need to have an answer for that and so you might lie so school like job pressure um or another reason is like you were saying you might not have gone to the doctor for years and so you might just not remember so might just not remember and so like Unlike that first question, in this case, you're not necessarily lying if you don't remember. You just don't remember. Uh, and so it's just, it's just a question of not knowing exactly the answer, even though you, you theoretically would. Um, I did this the other day. Huh? <laughs> I, I'm, I put down a phony date from when the last time I went to the doctor was. <laughs> <Nice. laughs> so it was... But like with females, they have to like regular doctor and like a gynecologist sure. and like they'll ask you, oh, when was the last time you went to see so-and-so? Mm. Oh, last August, something like that. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, you don't really know all, like I, who know, who remembers like the last time they went to a specific doctor? I, it all kind of blunts together. So it, it's still difficult. Um, oh, yeah. All right, so those are just two examples of very broadly response bias. One in which case the person's intentionally lying and the other one where they're kind of unintentionally lying. Um, but there are some more specific examples. So interview error, uh, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's basically the interviewer is swaying responses one way or the other uh, in either intentionally or unintentionally. So they might not even know they're swaying responses. Uh, yeah. And so this example I have here, basically you have like a call center or something and they're doing customer service surveys and you have two representatives and one is super grouchy and obnoxious and mean and the other one is super friendly and they're really nice. And they're, just, they're asking exactly the same questions, uh, but you, you get very different results, right? Like you might, the, the mean guy, people might say no to, they might get bad reviews to him just because he's mean and grouchy or the tone of his voice, maybe he sounds annoyed all the time. And so you, you don't give him, you don't give the company good reviews because he just, he's just kind of getting, getting to you. Uh, and whereas the other person's always happy and always uh, pleasant and you you give the company great reviews for her because she's just very friendly and you want to talk to her. So um, it might lead to different, things. And again, neither of these people might intentionally be doing this. They, the one just might naturally be grouchy and the one just naturally might be happy, but it's swaying the results unintentionally just by their, their approach. Right. So, uh, so I don't know why might these interviewers be opposite results, uh, uh, happy, uh, results and better reviews, um, just by Positive interaction, maybe with customer, and and this might, I mean, this isn't good either. Like just because the customer gives good reviews because this this interviewer is really happy, it's not necessarily good for the company because they're not getting truthful data. Like 
if, if you're a company trying to get representative data about your customer satisfaction, you, you probably want someone who's almost monotonous and very neutral, <laughs> one way or the other, because this person is just as harmful to their data as the company or the person giving them grouchy results. So you want like a very neutral interviewer. And again, a lot of these things are very difficult, like interviewing people, it's probably very difficult. All right, especially if you want accurate results. Uh, right. Yeah, so, but it's not like customer service, like you want the happy-go-lucky person? Well, yeah, but so like for customer service proper, like if you're you're trying to help them do something, but if you're like trying to uh, survey people, like I had a call Blue Cross Blue Shield the other day, I, they sent me a letter and I had to ask about it. But uh, a few days later, I got a call from a company like, I don't know, like a Long Island or something. And they're like, we're with Blue Cross Blue Shield and we want to ask you how your, your, how your interaction was. And so I guess they like, Blue Cross Blue Shield hires this company to call their customers who call their call center uh, in order to pull and understand how well their call centers are at, like operating. So like they kind of try to get feedback about their customer service interactions. Um, and so if, if that, yeah, so for customer service itself, you want a happy person. But if you're trying to get feedback from customers about your customer service, you want a very neutral interviewer so that it doesn't sway the results. Otherwise, they're not really doing their job. I understand that, but like if there's nothing customer service can do, yeah, but be happy, go lucky, and try to make you a little bit better. <laughs> oh, yeah, then... yeah, that's great. Yeah, customer service should be happy, go lucky. But if you want a survey, then you should probably try to be neutral. So, kind of different aims because the survey people, you're not actually like for the survey, if you're interviewing people to try to understand how they how their customer service is, you're not actually helping anyone. If anyone thinks you're kind of annoying them but, um, because you're calling them. But if I understand this correctly, you want the customer service people to be happy go lucky, but yeah. the survey people, you want to be neutral. That way they're not affecting yes. the customer service. Yeah. Yeah. Because the whole purpose, the whole purpose of the survey person was to gauge my level of satisfaction with the customer service. So to get an accurate gauge, you, you want someone to be neutral. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so interview error. Uh, and again, we're just kind of going through some examples of uh, response bias. So that was one of them. Uh, the next one is misrepresented answers. So, and this kind of is an example, this is uh, another kind of like psychological problem that you might encounter with doing questionnaires and polls and surveys and stuff. People might overstate their responses. So things like, you know, uh, it depends on the person, obviously. How many push-ups can you do? Or what is your salary? Or, you know, uh, especially with like students, uh, college students, if you ask them how, off, how many hours a night they sleep, for some reason, a lot of them would be like, oh, I sleep like one hour. Like they wanna seem like they're working a lot. I don't know. Um, things like that, where people want to overstate their abilities or what they do or something um, are examples. Um, but, you know, you can probably think of more. Anything that someone is self-conscious about or wants people to think about them would be an example of misrepresented answers. All right. Um, so I don't know, there's not much, not much to that one. The, the way you would fix this it is, is kind of like that first example we did with the drugs. Um, you probably have to be very careful how you're asking questions and maybe try to ask your questions a couple different ways to try to kind of almost trick them into telling the truth. So instead of asking how many push-ups can you do, I don't know. I don't know about that one. You might just have them do the push-ups. <laughs> um, but um, for that, like your salary, you could ask them several different uh, questions and if you ask certain questions that might help you understand what their salary actually is. So if someone says their salary is like 200,000, but then you ask them like, oh, you know, uh, where do you live? What kind of car? Like if you ask some things that might help you gauge someone's financial uh, stability or, or income, you can kind of figure out what something's off. You know, if someone's making 200,000 and they're you know, driving like a, I mean, it's not impossible. I feel like Warren Buffett drives a bad car. But if someone's making like a ton of money and they're driving like a, a broken down rusty like Taurus or something, uh, or Civic, then you might be like, oh, it doesn't sound right. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Salary question. Could you ask them like how much do they make a year and how much do they make hourly? Yeah, you could ask them multiple. Yeah, you could do that too. And then, like, you I know. Mean, you could work a ridiculous amount of hours and make a little bit of money, <laughs> but that's not 
as likely, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. If you ask them what their salary is and then hourly rate, you could be like, oh, well, that means you work like a billion hours, which is wrong. You can also ask them what their job is. And, you know, if they're making a ton of money and they're like, I don't know, like a, a teacher or something, you'd be like, that doesn't sound right. Um, but, I don't know, you know, different ways. But it's, it is hard. It's still really hard to ask questions like that on the survey and get accurate results. Um, right. uh, and kind of, again, these are all related, but wording of questions is also really important. And so this is an example I talked about. And I had, where'd it go? I found the exact numbers. Oh, here it is. Um, so this Pew Research example that I mentioned was they asked like, you know, so it was, do you favor the Iraq war? And then they asked the same question. So, but with um, even if there are US uh, casualties. Right. So they asked it two different ways. And uh, let, me, let me find the numbers. I think, so when they asked it this way, do you favor intervention in the war um, without the casualty clause? 68% said yes. And 25%, I don't know where the rest went, 25% said no. I think the rest probably just didn't respond um, or said something else, they, maybe they're in the middle. And then when they added the casualty clause, only 43% said yes. And 48% said no. Again, I don't know why it doesn't add up. But I don't know how the Pew, Re Pew Research Center obviously knows statistics. So <laughs> I think the, the remaining are probably like, a not response or something. Um, but yeah, so just straight question, do you favor the, the Iraq war? Or it was something similar. 68% said yes, almost 70%. Uh, and then when they added this clause, it went down to almost 40%. So, you know, you, you have a, a, a pretty big difference there. It's essentially the same question. This question just lacks that clause. Like it's not, it doesn't even say, it's not saying do you favor the Iraq war with no casualties. It's just saying, do you favor the war? With the implication is that there would be regardless in either case. So the, this like extra clause changes it drastically. So, um, and this, this is the technique that people like the Pew Research Center use actually to, to actually gauge interest, if that makes sense. So they'll ask it two different ways like this. And what this result tells them is that people generally support the war, but they only support it up to a certain point. Like it kind of, it says that they support it up to the point really where you start having US, US casualties. At that point, favor falls drastically, right? So, you know, if, if this was a different war, you might see different results. Like, I don't know if they did similar polls in like World War II, but if you ask like this question instead of Iraq war, if you ask World War II, you might see different results. You might see overwhelming support in almost both categories because Certain wars more popular, <laughs> um, all right. Um, but yeah, so it's it's a, it's, it's a, actually a tool. The wording, if you do it correctly, can be a tool in which you can properly gauge support of a topic. Yeah. All, right. all right, here's another example, and this one is not one that was done smartly. All right. So if you wanted to ask someone how much they studied, and you just said. How much do you study? What's wrong with that question in terms of like a poll or a survey? Like, so in the first, in the first, it's too open. So open, and we'll talk about this later, open means that there's, it's not clear, like there, it's open-ended. There is, there's not like a list of answers. Um, so like, what do you stu study what? Like if you're talking to a college student or a high school student, like what class are you talking about? You're talking about all classes, um, and then you're not providing a time frame, right? So what time frame? Like, are you talking about every day? Are you talking about how much do you study a week, a month? How much do you study, you know, every, every day in school? Are you talking about out of school? You know, there's just a lot of different possibilities. And so 
this question is too open on its own. So what you would want to do, so you'd want to ask a question like, instead of saying, how much do you study? You want to say something like, how much do you study Spanish on a weekly basis? Study Spanish weekly. Right? And that's probably specific enough. You could say if you could say in school if you wanted to, but you, you wouldn't. I mean, it depends what you want to study. Um, but yeah, how much do you study Spanish? So we're providing a topic and then weekly. Now, you wouldn't necessarily have to provide a class. You could say, how much do you study for school every week? And that would also be relatively specific. So if you, studied how, if you said, how much do you study school at home once every week, that's clear enough. Because then they're saying, oh, that's every day when I sit down and do some work, I'll count that as studying. And so you can kind of calculate it more clearly. But if you don't provide any information, this is just too broad. right? So it, it's very important you know, closed ended questions, or at least very clear questions. The, the more clear, the better, preferably if there can be a list of answers they could choose from. This one would be more difficult to do that with, but, all right. And for questions, even the order is interesting, oddly enough. Um, in, uh, there, there's research done on what answers people pick more generally. So I think, is it, if I'm remembering correctly on, um, on like tests and stuff, people tend to choose earlier questions. Whereas on phone call surveys, people choose latter questions. And the reason that is, is because like, if you ever, if you ever like answered questions on a phone, you're listen, you're standing there listening to the, to the questions and the possible choices. And you're only remembering a few at a time, right? So depending how complicated they are. And so you'll probably choose one of the later ones because that's what you just heard. And you don't maybe remember one of the earlier ones, especially if there's a lot of answers. So, uh, you know, depending on the medium that you're pulling, you might have a tendency to go towards the beginning of an answer list or bottom of an answer list, right? So, um, in the case of the phone calling, it's called the recency effect. Right? It's kind of weird. And yeah, so st statistics and, and polls and surveys, a lot of psychology kind of plays into how they form these things. Um, especially when people are involved, obviously only when people are involved, uh, but it's really difficult. <laughs> um, so let's see, let's try an example. So this one, suppose you want to ask, do you approve or disapprove of the president? So uh, this question seems really innocuous, right? Like it doesn't seem like there's anything bad or wrong with it. You, it's just, do you approve or disapprove of the president? But <laughs> I, I think this is one example where people, so if it was just, a or B, people would choose A more. Like there's some kind of psychological thing going on. So what they do in professional polling is if they want to ask a question like this, where it's like, choose A or B, what they'll do is they'll, they'll take A and B and they'll just keep swapping them back and forth. So like, suppose, suppose you're giving this question to a thousand people, right? What a professional poll, uh, like Pew Research Center or like Gallup, what they would do is they would randomize the order at which these appeared. They, some people would get disapproved or approved first and other people would get approved and disapproved second. So if you randomize the order, you, you remove this effect because it's random. And so even if, you, if you know, people generally choose the first question, it's gonna be randomized so that people will generally choose the first question, but also the second question, and it should be even-ish. <laughs> so, it's all about negating effects to the extent, maximum extent possible, right? So, um, so ran, randomize, uh, approve, disapprove, right? right? Any questions so far? As you, as you can see, it's really, this is like a really complicated topic. And so like whenever people say like, oh, well, the polls are not like presidential polls, like the polls are never right. It's because of things like this, like sampling is tragically difficult. Asking questions is really difficult. Like it, it seems really simple, but it's not. And that's why polls don't often end up right. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So we just had the order. And then the last thing with questions, and we've met, we've touched on this a second ago, but um, as we said, an open question allows the responder to choose an answer. It's open-ended. They can write down whatever they want. A closed question um, has a list. 
of things they can choose from, right? And so I have another example here. And so just like the Pew Research Center example, this is another one. So let me find my data. Uh, here it is. So I forget, I think Gallup asked this question. Um, basically it said, what issue, you know, issue matters most to you in deciding how you vote for president? Um, and so they, they did two polls. And in the one poll, they just left it at that and let people fill in what issue that they thought was most important to them. And then in the second poll, they provided a list. They said the economy, they like war, healthcare, all, a list of like the war on terror. I, I, it's a, from the early 2000s. Um, all sorts of things like that. Um, and what happened, oddly enough, was that in the open poll, only 38% said the economy. said economy, right? But in the closed poll, 58% said economy, oops, right? So again, it's, it's still all these weird things where the psychology of the people you're polling, you have to sort of consider almost like, so in the open poll, where people were able to choose their own answers without a list, people only just under 40% chose the economy. But when you provided them a list, that jumped to tw jumped 20 percentage points. You went from almost 40 to almost 60. So it's, it's kind of interesting. And I don't honestly know what that means. Like, if you wanted to interpret this result in terms of public policy. Now, I have a question. Yeah. What if you gave them a list, but then at the bottom, like the last bullet point, you could put other and then put your own? Yeah, I don't know what ha would happen there. I mean, I think my guess would be that it would probably be closer to the closed version because people would probably read through that list and be like, oh yeah, the economy is important to me. And then probably it's almost like they see the one on the list that they think is important and they might not get to the bottom where it says other, you know? So you know what I mean though? Like, people that are really strong on one topic but it's not there oh and that's a good point one. that's true but, but if the other it kind of gets both of them that's a good point yeah i don't know you might be right actually it might it might be that if you have a list then so like you know suppose on this list they didn't have like um like abortion or something then on the open poll you might have a good number of people who list abortion and then in the closed poll if it's not an option they might list the economy or something. So that's that's true. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, but it, it also, so it, it kind of also demonstrates the importance of choosing your answers correct carefully, right? If you're, if you're providing answers, then you should have kind of everything that you think is the, the core topics that people would choose. Like, it's not, it doesn't really matter if you leave off something negligible, like no one really cares about the state of like small town bakeries. But like if you leave off something important like healthcare, or like abortion or something that people really care about, you're gonna skew your kind of results one way. Cool. All right, so in summary for questions, uh, they should be clear and specific, should be closed-ended. Although like you said, the open-ended questions are important, but you have to be careful. <laughs> um, balanced, so uh, you don't, oh, I didn't, list this we didn't talk about this but you know the wording of the the question is important so you shouldn't have like um oh that goes again here too don't have weird don't like have language that people might be bothered by it might sway them um and even language that might not be any offensive at all might be kind of might sway your results so um this this example here uh about language so i don't remember all the details but there was uh on the sats there was a, a question about water polo. And there was a concern that people like inner city, uh, lower socioeconomic people would not, it, they, they theoretically should have been able to answer the question. I think it might've been like on the Pythagorean theorem or something, you know? But the fact that it had, it involved water polo, like it, it was presented in terms of water polo. So, the idea that they might not understand water polo is. And so that might just, they might just see the question and be like, oh, I can't answer it. Even though they could, 
fundamentally, they just might see the, those, this like language that's, that's over the question and say, oh, I can't answer it because I don't know what this is. And it just kind of, they kind of just blow by it. And so there, there's, there's been a push, it might, I think it was a few years ago, to kind of make the SAT more, more sensitive to different like socioeconomic or cultural kind of topics. Um, kind of make it sure every, it's make, make sure the examples are things that literally everyone can understand and relate to, which is difficult. Um, although water polo, obviously, no one knows what water polo is, um, <laughs> right? So even though it's not offensive, it could sway your results. And then balance as well, like you know, make sure it's if if you say you know where to go, like this. No, this one here, like this example. You so you could argue that this question where it says, even if there are US casualties, you could argue that that's not balanced, right? Because you're swaying them because no one wants like soldiers to die. So the Pew Research Center used this as an example for, for, their, for their own purposes. But if you had just asked the second question, it, it could be, you could be accused of trying to sway the results by having not, a, not balanced, right? You're not being very neutral, right? All right, so questions. Oh, we're doing pretty good actually. I guess we'll just, um, let's see. Let me finish this one. And then I wanna talk about something before class ends. There. So this is the last type of response bias. Uh, and it's, it's the most basic bias that you have. When people think of bias, this is the one they think of. Um, uh, you know, basically like um, a tobacco, tobacco firm sponsoring um, tobacco research. Right, that, that's what you'd think of. Like when you think of bias, this is it. So this is the very stereotypical bias that you think of. And the other ones are the more difficult ones that you might not be aware of. Um, but this is basically, if you're doing research or a survey and, and you have some interest in the results being one or the other. So, you know, tobacco sponsoring something involving tobacco like they did, or like ExxonMobil sponsoring climate change. sponsoring uh, climate change, change research. All right, so things like that are just clear self, self interests kind of biases. Like even, you know, they're, spot, they're giving people money to do this research. So the people might feel obliged to, to make the research favorable to these companies or to these people. Um, yeah. And it, you know, this, this isn't even necessarily, it doesn't even need to be this severe. Like maybe uh, it's, maybe you're a researcher doing a survey and like you put a poll out and, and your goal is to kind of affirm earlier results that you had in, a, in an earlier research paper. Maybe you're trying to kind of confirm your own, your research yourself. So you kind of sway it in one way. So you have a nice result. So things like that happen all the time uh, in, in, in certain fields where people are trying to try to fulfill their own kind of results, make kind of make it, you know, kind of nudge it one way. So it looks really good and they publish it and it looks really great in a paper, but it's not necessarily true because they kind of nudge things a little bit. So that's another example. That's a more realistic example. All of these definitely happen, right? I think tobacco like did a lot of research in like the fifties or something to try to, you know, public opinion, try to move things towards pro tobacco, but um, you know, self-interest. All right, any questions? Okay, so there, there's a, well, I'm not going to do 11 page, maybe that may Tuesday, um, but it is five, but I want to talk about one thing before we end. So it might be a few minutes after five, but um, I'm going to put up, uh, this is our final project of the year, uh, and <laughs> I hope it's not too bad, but I tried it last semester. I got mixed results. I got some good projects, so hopefully our, this, this semester works too, um, but the idea I haven't posted this on Blackboard yet, but, and we, we'll have to go over this more. Maybe I'll make another video and post it or something. But um, the whole point of this topic is to look at statistical studies and try and get a gauge on them. And what we're gonna do is we've kind of defined some basics uh, about statistics. We've talked about population samples. We've talked about bias, which is important. And what we wanna do is we wanna examine two papers, all right? Uh, and, and we wanted these, both these papers involve defensive gun use. So defensive gun use is like, 
you know, someone breaks in your home and they try to kill you, it doesn't happen very often, and you use your gun in defense, or like you're being mugged in somewhere in Buffalo, or like, I don't know, I don't know, Orlando or something, and uh, you, you shoot someone and defend yourself. Defensive gun use. You're not killing people, you're, I mean, you might be, but you're doing it defensively. Um, and so there is research done on this. There's a lot of research done on this. And it, it's, it's one of those situations where they could be using literally the same data, but their, their answers are on the opposite ends of the spectrum. <laughs> um, and so there's two positions, mainly. The one is that around two and a half million Americans use their guns every year for self-defense. And as a result, uh, guns result in fewer deaths. Uh, the other end of the spectrum, again, they use like the same data, so it's amazing this happens. But the other end of the spectrum is that defensive gun use happens rarely, uh, around 80,000 times per year. All right. And so the two positions are important because if this position is, if this is true, and this many defensive gun uses occur actually in the United States every year, then guns save lives. If this one's true, then owning a gun would potentially result it, 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 it doesn't increase your chance of saving yourself or protecting anyone. It's just, it's just like a fashion accessory um, <laughs> that kills people occasionally. So both, it's important to, for us to understand that which one of these is true. And there's really no way to know. Like the, the, the statistics are, it's so difficult to gauge this when this actually happens that it's impossible to get a good answer. But two people, what we're gonna talk about mainly, the first one is Gary Kleck. Uh, and he's a, I think he's at Florida State University. Uh, I think he's a professor of criminology, something, I think he's a professor of criminology or criminal justice or something. Um, and his, his stance is the first one, that there is a lot of defensive gun uses, it's common and it saves lives. Um, and the second is this guy named David Hemingway and he's at Harvard uh, and he uh, is, he espouses the second position where it's a rare event, all right? And so what this, what, this is, what this project is going to be is you looking at these two papers, and I'll post this on Blackboard at some point, and I have links here for you to, to look at them. Um, and they're, they're freely accessible. I don't think you need, like, you don't even need JSTOR or anything. They're just online. Um, and what you're going to do is you're going to look at these two papers, and you're going to write a short paper, three pages, three to four pages, somewhere in there. Um, and I give you some guidelines, it's standard, standard things, double in, double space kind of thing. Um, oh, I got to revise this. Don't worry about this. Um, you're going to write a paper and you're going to first summarize the two results. So you're going to skim these two people's papers, uh, here we are, Kleck and Hemingway, and you're going to summarize the results and how they argue the results. All right, then what you're going to do, is you're going to try to, to take a position. You're going to follow Kleck or you're going to follow Hemingway. And I want you to, to argue to me why you take one position or the other. And there's no right or wrong answers. Like, as I said, it's impossible to know at the actual number. So uh, you can take either, it doesn't matter. You, I just need to see that you're trying to analyze their results a little and trying to understand how they get to where they're going. And I want to see if you can find any, any possible sources of bias in the other, other paper, all right? Um, Question, can yeah. I just give you my gun control paper I just wrote for English? <laughs> Literally my English class, my criminal justice class, and this class today have all talked about gun control. That's really funny. That happened to me last semester too. It must be the same classes. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, assuming, well, you can probably just change it a little. I just, because I want to, I'm, I'm not really interested in gun control. I'm really interested. Well, I, in... I was just joking. I just, oh. <laughs> ironic. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, that's kind of funny. That is really ironic. Um, no, but yeah. So and I give you some qu kind of questions here. As I said, it's very open. This is very open under this, this project. So describe how the study was done. How did they conduct their sampling? Was it done correctly and without bias? This is impossible to answer, but you can try. Um, what are the variables? And we have to talk about some of these things, but I just wanted to present this now so that you can kind of get started. I'll post it on Blackboard and then we can kind of work on it as we go. Cause I wanted to give you as much time as possible. And there's only uh, a few weeks, a couple weeks left. So, uh, but it's only three or four pages. So hopefully it's not bad. Um, were they biased? Uh, how was the data collected? 
Were the results presented clearly and do they make sense relative to unknown data? So there's a lot of things that you can talk about. Um, but yeah, as I said, I'll post this shortly. It's really interesting though. So um, this is this is the one paper. This is uh, this is by Hemingway. So this is the one where he says that it's rare, uh, and that's what he's arguing. Um, and this is the one by Clack. And I don't expect you to read these papers entirely. So this Clack's paper is like girth. It's like thick. It it's so big. It it's I mean it's not that long. I guess it's uh, what pages? Eight, I don't know pages. It's, it's maybe 30, 40, 30, 40 pages. I think it's like 30 pages. Uh, Hemingway's is a little shorter. It's probably only 10, 15. Um, but they're both relatively readable, which is nice. Like we don't, you don't strictly need to take a class in statistics to read some of these papers. You might not understand some of the, some of the terminology and some of the analysis is, a, is above us. Like in Kleck's paper, he has a ton of tables and stuff. And these tables aren't technical really. Um, you can you can read them and and really understand what they're saying without too much of a background. Um, so this is like a frequency. Using, so this is a study of surveys that the people did and the results. It's really interesting. So, uh, but yeah, I don't expect you to fully read these. I one of the a nice one of the, a nice skill to have is to try to skim papers and try to understand what they're saying in br kind of briefly without really thoroughly going through things. So. I would expect you to kind of skim them, at least read the introduction, try to vaguely understand how they're functioning. Kleck, I think Kleck does a phone interview. Um, and Hemingway's whole paper really is just uh, anti-Kleck. So, <laughs> so uh, he has a phone interview. Hemingway is just like trashing Kleck. He kind of tries to take down his argument. Um, and yeah, it, it should be fun. So as I said, I'll post this shortly. Maybe this weekend or tomorrow. I, I always say shortly. It's always like a week. It won't be that long. Um, and you can get started on it. I have to revise this form. But um, yeah, so just kind of mentally prepare yourself. It's a short paper, three to four paper, three to four pages, double space, 12 point font kind of thing. I have a but, question. Yeah. When you say three to four pages, yeah. every teacher is different. Do you mean just onto the third page or do you mean to like to the bottom of the third page? Or are you one of those teachers that just wants all of those questions answered and it's good enough? Oh yeah, I don't really care. Um, as long as it's, if it's three pages, I'll take it. If it's on the third page, it's good. Okay, because like some of my teachers will say like four pages, but it's four full pages. Oh, yeah. No, yeah, I know. I, I just want to see that you're doing some analysis and trying to read the papers, really. So if, you, if you're kind of looking at things, even if it's two pages and a line on the third, which is not advisable, try to make a, a little more than a, like two pages and a line. But I'll take it still if it's only two pages and one line. Okay, so you want a decent amount on the third page, but you don't want. It doesn't. I'm not going to take points off. But... Okay, because like my teacher literally puts all of these essays into a Word document and click to see how many lines it is from the fifth page. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm not going to do that. No, no. Like it's ridiculous. Like he tells us he's going to take off a point for each line you are away from the fifth page. Oh, that's too much. I'm not into that kind of thing. I, uh, no, I'll take points off if, if I don't, if I, if I see you not like, I just want to see analysis. All right. Okay. Yeah. This and I, us to get our work done. So there's not really a strict range with, with the pages, but you want about that many. Yeah. About this money. Yeah. Somewhere in that range. Like if it's on the third page, it's, it's fine. Yeah. But if you need to go on the fourth, it's also okay. You probably won't need to. Um, three pages should be more than enough because you're just summarizing. And then uh, we, we're not like a full statistics course, so we don't have a whole lot of stuff to work with, but um, we're, we're just kind of, we're trying to find some sources of bias. And you feel free to do more research if you wanted to on Cleck and Hemingway. There, there's, like, there's like a feud between these guys, I swear. Um, <laughs> Cleck says something and then Hemingway says something and they, it's like a back and forth. So, um, uh, but yeah, I'll post this shortly. So just kind of prepare for that. Um, but any questions? And this will be due at the end of the semester by the last day of class. I'm not going to put like a proper due date on it. I'll just say by the last, by the last class. Uh, so, you know, it gives you ample time to read and kind of analyze stuff. But, all right. Any questions? All right. So I will see everyone Tuesday 
uh, feel free to shoot me an email this weekend if you have other issues, but hopefully you have a nice weekend.